Thanks everyone for joining us for the first webinar in a four-part series called Advances in Endodontic Therapy. It's going to explore topics in diagnosis, preparation, irrigation, and obturation of the root canal space. Sponsored by Kerr Endodontics, this series is offered expressly for you as members of the Next EDS user community. Thanks for joining us. My name is Rich Groves. I'm the Vice President of Academic Affairs for the Next EDS, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to your speaker this evening, Dr. Gary Glassman. Hi there. Dr. Glassman has a private practice limited to endodontics in Toronto, Ontario. That's in Canada, for those of you, and is one of the most respected educators in the field. He has won every award in the space and stood at every podium talking about this topic. He is one of the world's foremost experts in endodontic therapy. He's going to share a little of his background in endodontics with you and present you a really informative discussion tonight. First, let's cover a few housekeeping items. We're going to be online for about 45 minutes of the presentation, where Dr. Glassman will be the, the featured speaker throughout. We're going to save some time at the end for your questions. If you could save those. Uh, we'd welcome the opportunity to address as many as we can in the time we have together tonight. You can forward them to me in the chat window and or simply enter them as we make our way through the, the presentation this evening. Uh, feel free to view full screen or if you want to watch our smiling faces, it's our pleasure. And um, we're going to get underway here. Without any further business to handle, let me introduce you to Dr. Gary Glassman. Thanks, Rich. It's really great to be here tonight. I'm very excited because in this four-part series, we're going to learn a lot of different things. Tonight, we're going to give you an introduction to endodontics and what it means to be successful at endo. We want to provide our patients with the opportunity to retain their teeth for a lifetime. And certainly, with respect to endodontics, uh, that allows us to do that. We're going to review the pulp complex and the canal anatomy. We're going to... Uh, assess pulpal conditions, we're going to go through a systematic diagnostic protocol, and uh, as important as it is, we want to make sure that we document everything accurately and properly. And then we'll have an opportunity later on to answer any questions that you may have. Now, with endodontics, really like any aspect of dentistry, there are a lot of moving parts. First of all, you got to provide yourself with straight line access. Once we provide ourselves with that, we got to find all the canals, got to find all the orifices. Once we do that, we need to negotiate the root canals to their individual apical termini. Once we've done that, we want to remove the smear layer, that inorganic organic layer that's created on that root canal wall during instrumentation. And of course, we need to remove the biofilm, which is that mucopolysaccharide matrix in which bacteria are hiding behind and within. Once we've done that, we want to seal off that root canal system, restore the tooth back to function, and of course, we need to do that in a pain-free environment, not only during the procedure so we can get the job done properly, but also to control the discomfort that the patient may experience afterwards in order to provide us with the best success possible. Now, there are a lot of complicating factors. As an endodontist, I don't get the opportunity really to treat a lot of clean cases. The cases that I see are full of obstacles, calcifying root canals, obstructions such as instruments, ledges, blocking out because of either soft tissue blockages or hard tissue blockages. And of course, we all want to find that MB2 canal, that MB2 canal which exists probably almost 100% of the time in maxillary first molars. And being able to find that, being able to provide our patients with being able to clean that root canal system in three dimensions is of utmost importance. Here's a case that was treated before. It's a very, very typical case that I see in my office where the patient presented with apical palpation, sensitive to biting, sensitive to percussion, on and off swelling. And fortunately, and we'll talk about this a little later on in the seminar, we have the advantage of 3D imaging, where not only will 3D imaging provide us with a higher resolution, but it'll also provide us with different uh, views of the tooth in three dimensions. So if an MB2 hasn't been found, we can see evidence that it may exist. If there's evidence of bony lesion that may represent uh, 
you know, consistency with a root fracture, then we can often see that as well. So you can run, but you can't hide now. Now that we have three-dimensional imaging, it opens up a whole new avenue to endodontic treatment. And in this particular case, it was the MB root that wasn't working. There was a lesion around the MB root, ape, the, MB, the mesial buccal root apex. So we made a nice little access. We found that MB2 and we were able to 3D disinfect it and then obturate it in three dimensions. Wonderful. And of course, if you take a look at this upper central incisor, this left central incisor, it's obvious that it's very calcified. Again, a very typical case that we have. And it's not uncommon during our root canal procedure that we may have to stop and take some radiographs along the way in order that we can redirect ourselves to find the root canal. And once we find it, negotiate our way to the apex, remove the smear layer, remove the biofilm, obturate it in three dimensions, and then subsequently restore the tooth. And these are the, uh, the trials and tribulations that we often encounter when we do root canal treatment, because no case is ever the same. And that's the wonderful thing about it. I often get asked, don't you get bored doing root canal treatment all day? And I really don't, because every patient is different and every case is different as well, presenting its own challenge. And if you decide to do root canal treatment in your office, whether it's a simple case or whether it's complex anatomy, you have to hold yourself to the same standard that's expected of a specialist for the procedure that's being performed, which means you've got to thoroughly debride that root canal system in its entirety, followed by three-dimensional obturation. Very important. But no matter how much you can learn and how much you read and how much I can teach you, nothing replaces clinical practice. Practice, practice, practice. That's important. I've been practicing for 30 years and I'm still learning. I'm learning every single day. So what is endodontics? You know, let's get to the root of things. Pardon the pun. Root canal 101. Well, there's two parts to a tooth, as we all know. There's the crown that you see and the root that you don't see. And inside the root, you got those hollow tubes called root canals that contains pulp tissue, which contains nerve tissue, lymphatics, and blood vessels. It's that pulpal complex. So the Latin term endo means inside. And of course, odont means tooth. So we're working inside the tooth. We're working in a dark hole. So a lot of times we're working on feel. We rely on our electrometric devices, such as apex locators. And of course, we rely on radiographs whenever we have to take them. So what's the main objective of dentistry? You know, we want to provide our patients with the best in service and the best experience. And of course, we want them to maintain their dentition, hopefully for a lifetime. And we need to prevent oral disease at the same time. So when we look at endodontics and we look at the main objective of endo, it's to prevent and or eliminate apical periodontitis. We want to prevent infection. And if infection is already there before we treat the tooth, we want to eliminate that. So the main objective of endo is to prevent and or eliminate apical periodontitis. Now, endo has been around for a very, very, very long time. I mean, in 1687, Charles Allen described the techniques of dental transplants. He wrote a book devoted exclusively just to the field of dentistry. And, you know, necessity at the time, and still is, the mother of invention. And we're experimenting with new things, and research and development is constantly advancing in order to provide ourselves with 3D disinfection and, of course, 3D obturation of the root canal system. Now, the aim of endo, once again, has always been to relieve pain and, if we can, maintain the vitality of the dental pulp and satisfy the objective of dentistry, which is to preserve the tooth or preserve the teeth. So when we look back at the early history of endodontics in 1725, Lazare, Lazare Riviere introduced the use of oil of cloves, which is that smell that we smell in dental offices, that smell of eugenol that we're all so familiar with, and its sedative properties. 1746, Pierre Fouchard described the removal of pulp tissue. In 1838, Edwin Maynard introduced the first root canal instrument, which he created by watch spring. 
And of course, in 1847, gutta percha was introduced by Edwin Truman. And we're still using gutta percha. And until something comes along that's better, gutta percha is right now the standard of practice as a core root canal filling material. Now let's look at the past. Let's look at the present and let's look at the future. Basically, we need to shape the root canal to allow us to provide the patient with 3D disinfection in that root canal system. And we have to think of it as a system. It's a branching network, just like a tree. Just like nature's created a tree, nature's also created the tooth with its multiple root canals and branches that arborize and come back together again. And it's a real challenge. And the future holds a lot of promise as new techniques with laser endodontics come into play and we allow us to achieve the objectives that we set out to, uh, to achieve. Now, dentists fall into a whole spectrum of, of emotions with resp respect to endodontics because it really is an emotional experience. And a lot of these feelings are defined by the level of skill that they have, the experience, the education that they've had, and of course, the competence. And what's your skill set? Where's your wheelhouse? Are you comfortable doing single rooted teeth? Or are you comfortable doing maxillary second molars with three or four or five root canals in it? Everyone will determine that level of comfort when you start working out in practice. And of course, again, I've been doing it for 30 years and I'm good, I'm better at some things than others. And I know my limitations as well. And you need to establish yours as well. Now, when we look at endodontics, there's a lot, a lot of emotions. You know, some of us love it, some of us like it, some of us fear it, some of us can't stand it, and some of us just, you know, we throw in the towel and we say, ah, I can't do it anymore. And there's a whole range of emotions and there's a whole range of doctors that will, you know, decide I'm going to do everything I can and some are going to do nothing. But at least you need to have knowledge of what's available should you decide not to, you know, go into any root canal treatment that uh, that comes your way. There's a lot of energy associated with it as well. And uh, the effects of pulpal disease on patients can be quite debilitating. You know, we get patients coming in with cans of soda, cold soda on their faces, or that uh, proverbial ice pack where, you know, the only thing that's going to resolve their discomfort is a nice cold ice pack. And uh, it can be debilitating. But the effects of treatment can be miraculous. It's amazing when you anesthetize a patient that's been in pain for three days and all of a sudden a smile comes across their face and they have this feeling of relief. Wonderful feeling. And you know that you're going to get them out of their pain, hopefully permanently. So let's look at the dental pulpal complex because it really is quite a unique environment. You know, the areas of dentistry sort of revolve around, you know, preserving that dental pulp. We need to protect it. We need to definitely respect it. And if there's decay, we need to remove it and quell any problems within that pulpal complex. And we're always trying to avoid it as well, because really we'd like to maintain its vitality wherever we possibly can, because it's a sterile environment. And once we make access into a tooth, then even though root canal treatment is quite successful, there is a chance that things could fail. So if we can keep it vital, that's always the, the goal. Now, the dental pulp has a formative and a protective function. And the only other place in our body that's very similar is the brain. Because the dental pulp, just as the brain, lie in what's called a low or non-compliant environment. Anytime there's inflammation and the blood vessels expand, there's no place for that expansion to occur because it lies within the rigid confines of the hard tooth structure, and in the case of the brain, the skull. So there's no place to go. So the only way to release pressure is to relieve the pressure by making access. In the case of the brain, of course, when patients suffer head trauma, they gotta go in through the skull to relieve the pressure. It's the same way within that dental pulp complex. We need to relieve the pressure within. And with patients that come in with symptoms, it's either caused by decay, it can be caused by irritation due to cold and heat. And uh, once the pulp becomes involved and things work their way apically or laterally, the supporting bone and the periodontal ligament can also be effective as well. 
So bacteria is what we're trying to get out of, a tooth that is non-vital or necrotic, and it's bacteria that we're trying to prevent from coming in to a case after we've treated it. And of course, if you follow all the moving steps and you find all the root canals and you get to the apical termini and you remove the smear layer, the biofilm, you 3D disinfect it and you observate it in three dimensions, we need to preserve that. We need to protect that with a properly timed and coronal restoration. Because if you don't and we get coronal leakage, then that bacteria can get into that root canal system and lead to failure or lead to non-healing. So it's the bacteria that we want to get out and the bacteria, of course, that we want to prevent from coming back in again. Because what happens is the bacteria in our oral cavity can get in through areas, conduits of decay, and work their way down the root canal system, cause pulpal disease, and subsequently periapical disease, or better aptly called periridicular, because it's not just around the apex, it can also be through lateral canals and other areas of the root other than just at the periapex. So let's take a look at why root canal treatment is done. Well, first of all, patients can come in with toothaches. You know, they sometimes have tooth sensitivity that's not remedied by something as, as simple as a desensitizing agent. Sometimes patients will undergo trauma. I see it all the time with kids, whether they're breaking the teeth, whether they're subluxating the teeth, or whether they're evulsing the teeth. Sometimes patients will get tooth discoloration, which can occur from minor trauma, and even sometimes from orthodontic treatment as well. Patients come in with swollen or tender gingiva, or abscesses, or what's very common, especially around this time of year, in the holiday season or after the holiday season, are cracked teeth. So let's take a look at the steps involved. Meet Dave. Dave's tooth is hurting and infected. His dentist told him he needs a root canal in order to treat the tooth. Dave has never had a root canal and is worried about the procedure. Dave's dentist assured him that despite what people say, root canal treatment can be a quick and comfortable experience. The day of his treatment, his tooth will be numbed and isolated with a dental dam in order to painlessly provide the procedure in a clean and safe work environment. A small hole is drilled through the surface of the tooth in order to gain access into the pulp chamber and subsequently the root canals. Once the infected pulp tissue has been removed, the root canals are precisely shaped using specially crafted instruments called files. Once shaped, the root canals are then cleaned and disinfected with special solutions. A thermal softened material called gutta percha is then delivered and compressed into the root canals, providing a three-dimensional seal in order to protect them from becoming reinfected. Once the root canals are sealed, the tooth is restored with a filling, then covered with a crown, which will re-establish its structural integrity, bringing the tooth back into normal function. Dave's tooth has been treated properly, restoring its strength and function and eliminating the infection and the pain. So let's take a look at root canal basics. Let's take a look at the sequence of events that occurs when we do root canal treatment. Of course, we would like to maintain the vitality of the tooth, but if we've committed the tooth to root canal treatment, first thing we need to do is remove the pulp tissue. We need to shape the canals in order to allow us to provide our patients with 3D disinfection. Once that's done, we wanna obturate the root canal system also in three dimensions and then restore that tooth with a restoration and crown wherever necessary and wherever possible. Now, whether you decide to do root canal treatment in one appointment or two is really up to you and your skill level and the status of the dental pulp. If you're able to complete it in one appointment, obviously that's great for the patient, but you don't wanna rush it. You wanna take your time. You wanna make sure that you follow all the steps properly and do quality endodontics. And that means going through a systematic diagnostic protocol, number one. Number two, take a radiograph to visualize the anatomy and also help in diagnostics. Once we've decided to embark on the treatment, we need to anesthetize that patient properly because we want to get the job done properly. And the only way we can do that is if the patient's not bouncing and moving around. And sometimes with nervous patients, conscious sedation is an optional thing that you may want to, may want to look at. Now, quality anodontics starts with rubber dam isolation. And as I travel around the world, I'm very disappointed to see that over 80% of dentists worldwide, and that number may be more, do not use rubber dam when they do their root canal treatment. And that is tenant number one. 
use rubber dam. If you can't place a rubber dam on a tooth, it has no business having root canal being done on it. Because as you'll see, if you don't use rubber dam, the sequelae can be quite, um, quite horrible. And we'll show you a case in a second. Once we've established rubber dam in good isolation, we want to make our access, locate our canals. We want to shape those canals to the apical terminus, irrigate as best as we possibly can. And of course, if we're going to bring that patient back for a second visit, you want to place an antibacterial medication such as calcium hydroxide, which is probably one of the only intracanal, interappointment medications that's uh, recommended by most endodontists worldwide. And then we place a temporary restoration in order to seal that root canal system as best as we can until appointment number two. Appointment number two, once again, I like to anesthetize my patients. Some don't, but I want to keep them comfortable. And again, conscious sedation wherever applicable. Rubber dam isolation, reaccess, freshen up the canals with your files, and do a final irrigation protocol, usually using full strength sodium hypochlorite. 17% aqueous EDTA, and a final flush of full-strength sodium hypochlorite. Dry the root canals, obturate them in three dimensions, and then restore the tooth. That's a lot to do on one tooth. If you can get it done on one appointment, fantastic. If you can't, slow down. Take your time. Do it in two visits. Some may want to do it in three visits. So once we're done, it's important that the patient is equipped with what they can expect in the manner of post-operative instructions. Quite often, as long as their medical history doesn't contraindicate it, I'll give the patient 400 milligrams of ibuprofen right at that appointment while they're still anesthetized. I wanna cut off that inflammatory cascade before it even starts, if I possibly can. Always easier to prevent discomfort and quell inflammation than it is to stop it once it's started. And of course, if they can't take non-steroidals, something else would have to be given from the selection of pain medications that you have in your armamentarium as well. It's important that if a patient is taking antibiotics that they fill and finish the prescriptions that you prescribe. And explain to them, it's not uncommon to feel discomfort after root canal treatment. And I use this sort of story to, to patients, even though the nerve is removed from the tooth, there's still nerves in the bone surrounding it, and it's almost like a little micro bruise. It's not uncommon to feel discomfort, sometimes for one, two, three, maybe four days, maybe even up to a week or more. And please tell your patient not to tap on their tooth. They didn't do that before the root canal. Why are they going to start doing it now? Doc, it hurts when I go like this. Don't do that. Post-op instructions, very, very important. So let's take a look at quality endodontics because quality endodontics starts with Isolation, and isolation means using rubber dam. Very simple. Place the rubber dam on the patient's tooth. Make sure that when you punch the hole in your rubber dam, as simple as this may seem, place it right in the middle of the rubber dam. So the tooth is in the middle of the frame of reference. You know, it's not like we're doing restorative dentistry where we're punching holes for every single tooth. If we're working on a maxillary first molar, don't punch the hole in the upper right-hand corner of the rubber dam, because the rubber dam is not going to sit properly. It's going to be very difficult to manipulate your files in the tooth. So make sure that we have the rubber dam punched in the middle. Make sure that the rubber dam clamp is secure. And use a plastic frame, because if you're going to be taking radiographs throughout, that metal frame is just going to get in the way. It's going to show up on the x-ray. So a plastic frame is where it's at. And I'll be honest with you, you know, if you don't use rubber dam, it is neglectful really is because these are real live radiographs taken at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto where rubber dam wasn't used and patient swallowed an endodontic file. Whoa, we can't have that happening. So quality endodontics starts with placing the rubber dam, right? Enough said about that, but first of all, we got to decide, does this patient need root canal treatment or not? You know, patient comes in pain and our job is to take that patient's problem and through a systematic diagnostic protocol, trying to figure out and solve the puzzle of this patient's pain and determine number one, what the diagnosis is, and number two, how are we gonna treat the pain? 
Sometimes it's dental and sometimes it's not, right? And if it's not, then we got to explore other avenues in order to help that particular patient. So when we have our patient come in and we're trying to provide them with that solution, we first of all have to gather information. So we're going on a data collection process. We're going on a reconnaissance mission. We're trying to gather as much information as we possibly can in order to provide a proper diagnosis and then subsequently provide that patient with the proper treatment in order to obviously get rid of their pain and discomfort. Did you know that probably, probably over 85% of all diagnosis can be made through intuition and clinical experience? And just by listening to the patient, you know, it's very, very common for us to lie that patient back and start hammering away on teeth and palpating their gums in order to come to a diagnosis. But if you just stop for a moment, just listen to the patient. Let them explain to you what they're feeling. You know, guide the interview. When did the when did the patient when did you start having pain? When did it when did you start having the toothache? Oh, after the filling? Okay, well now things are starting to register. Everything was fine until the filling was done. Are you having hot and cold sensitivity? Is it fleeting? Is there anything that resolves the pain or discomfort? Listen to the patient. Try to guide the patient and let them tell you what the problem is. And without even banging on a tooth or taking an ice stick out, you can probably come to a diagnosis many times. So I use the mnemonic soap. Very, very common. Soap. We're going to get subjective information. Have the patient in their own words tell you exactly what the problem is. Objective information means doing your clinical tests. Once we got our subjective information and we've done our clinical test and received our objective information, then we can assess all the info that we've got and then we can come up with a treatment plan. SOAP. Remember it. Very easy to. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to ask the patient in their own words, what are you feeling? It's called the chief complaint. Well, it hurts when I go outside and I breathe air. You know, what's the current status of disease? Have the patient point with their finger where the pain is coming from. You know, what's the history of it? Did you have ortho done before? Did you have trauma? Did you have a filling? Was there a big cavity? How frequent does the pain come? What's the severity of it? Is it spontaneous? Is there anything that relieves the pain? So getting this information will provide you with a lot and enable you to move on towards that diagnosis. And of course, when we look at objective information, that means clinical and visual examination. This starts the moment you introduce yourself to the patient or the moment you walk into the operatory and you see the patient for the very first time when they present it to your office. Do they have swelling? Are they holding their face in pain? And then you go to the clinical tests, which are very informative, and a radiographic examination. Now, we'll talk about radiographs. The radiographs aren't the end-all, be-all. They're an adjunct. They're help. They're an aid for diagnosis, and they should be treated just as that, not solely to rely on a radiograph for the diagnosis. So when we assess the information, we have to understand that there's no ideal classification for pulp and periradicular disease. You know, if you want to make a histological diagnosis, it means you've got to remove the pulp and you've got to examine it histologically. And until such a time that we do that, we base our classification on clinical and radiographic findings. And we have to make a dual diagnosis. We have to make a diagnosis based on pulpal status and a diagnosis based on periradicular status. So let's look at the diagnostic test because the purpose of diagnostic tests is to reproduce the patient's symptoms. Listen, we don't want the patient to walk away saying, oh, the dentist hurt me, but we need to know which tooth is causing the problem and we need to reproduce. So what I always do is when I do my tests, whether they're pulpal tests or periridicular tests, I always test a normal tooth first. It may be far away from the area that I suspect, but I want the patient to be comfortable. I want the patient to provide me with a lot reliable response. If I go directly to the suspect tooth and start hammering away, that patient's not going to trust me. The patient may not give me an accurate response. So I'm going to tell the patient I want to test a normal tooth. And I repeat that word. I say I want to test a normal tooth. 
And I repeat normal over and over again. So I'll go somewhere distant from where the patient's complaining of the pain. It may be in the opposite arch. It may be on the, uh, on the other side of the mouth. I say, this is a cold test. What do you feel? And they're relaxed, right? Or I'll tap on a tooth that I know is a normal tooth. Now they're relaxed and everything's great. And now I can start my test and sort of narrow in on the suspect too. So these are called pulp sensitivity tests. In some arenas, they're called pulp sensibility tests. And different tests, such as uh, cold tests and hot tests, they assess only the pulp sensitivity, but not pulpal blood flow. If you want to evaluate pulpal blood flow, then go out and get yourself a laser Doppler flow meter. That'll show you true pulp flow. You really need to know it? Probably not. We just need to know the sensitivity that the patient's experience in order to make an accurate diagnosis in order to plan the treatment that we're going to provide for that individual patient. So let's look at thermal testing. Because when you look at thermal testing, cold or hot, the responses to stimuli can be either normal, they can be exaggerated or lingering, or you may get no response at all. If you've got a tooth with a crown on it and a lot of insulating dentin in a calcified canal, you may have a normal pulp, but you still may not get a response. Right? So we've got to look at thermal testing with a little bit of grain of salt. So when we look at cold testing, cold testing will stimulate the A-delta nerve fibers. <clears throat> it's an immediate response with the A-delta nerve fibers. It's an immediate response and a normal pulp remission will be very, very quick. They'll feel it, yeah, I feel it, and it goes away. Yeah, it's gone. If it increases in intensity or it duplicates the patient's pain, reproduces what they're feeling, then that's abnormal. And again, no response could be normal or it could be abnormal. Normal in a case where there's no response, where you have thick insulating dent and calcifying pulp space, where they may just not get a response, but they may have a normal, normal nerve and pulpal complex, and an abnormal response may be where the pulp is non-vital. Right? So how do we do that? Well, you can do many ways. You can use a refrigerant, such as endo ice, and place it on a cotton pellet, or you can use something that's more familiar to the patient, like an ice stick. <clears throat> I personally like an ice stick because ice is familiar to the patient. I'll often say to my patients, I'm going to take a little popsicle, and I'm going to touch a normal tooth right now, and I want to see what normal feels like. And then I'll narrow in on the suspect too. In my hands, I find that refrigerant, if in, until, unless you take that cotton pellet to the mouth very, very quickly, quite often the refrigerant evaporates very quickly and you often don't get a reliable response. So that's how we do it. How do we make our ice sticks? Very simple. You can take uh, sterilized anesthetic cartridge, used sterilized anesthetic cart uh, carpules and fill them up with water, put a little dental floss in them and then put a bunch of them in a little paper cup and then put them in your freezer. And when you're ready to use it, you take one out, you or your assistant will warm it up, it'll melt the outer layer of that ice stick and you can pull it out with a piece of dental floss. Pretty cool trick. Very simple and inexpensive as well. Now, let's look at hot testing because hot testing has been done with different things. You know, and I've seen it all in the last 30 years. Some take a ball burnisher and heat it in a flame and touch the tooth. Ouch! Do you know that that can actually cause a normal pulp to become necrotic or go into irreversible pulpitis? Taking a profi cup and generating heat can also be very deleterious to the dental pulp. But if you take some warm gutta percha in some of these devices that you have available that warm it up probably to a, the temperature of a hot cup of coffee, it gives you a nice accurate response, but it's also safe. And what heat does, it stimulates the deep sea nerve fibers. And these deep sea nerve fibers, it's a delayed response. So you're not gonna feel it right away, unlike cold. So you may have to hold that heated gutta percha or the warm gutta percha on the patient's tooth for a count of 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, and then remove it and wait. And if they don't feel it, then go on there for maybe five seconds and then take it off. Don't place it on the tooth and wait for the patient to feel it and then remove it because that patient will not be a happy camper. And if you do, 
make sure that you got a cold glass of water to reduce that pulpal pressure immediately. So this is a hot pulp test tip. And Kerr Endodontics has a beautiful one where a ball of gutta percha is placed on the end of this hot pulp test tip. That's a tongue twister, hot pulp test tip. Say that 10 times real fast. Place it on the tooth for a count of three seconds and then remove it. And if they don't feel it, put it back on for a count of four seconds and then remove it and so on and so forth. A response that remits within 30 seconds is pretty normal. If it increases in intensity or compared to another tooth or reproduces the patient's pain, that's abnormal. And just like the cold test, you know, no response may be normal or abnormal. Now the electric pulp test tip, you know, I find the electric pulp test tip, the, great, the greatest use for it is to test the profoundness of my local anesthetic. How many times have you worked on a lower second molar what we call a hot tooth, tooth that has an irreversible pulpitis, and you anesthetize the patients with a mandibular block, you get good lip and chin signs. The patient's ache is gone, but as soon as you start drilling in that tooth, they start feeling it. So before I do that, I'll make sure that they are numb and they are anesthetized properly. And if I put my electric pulp test tip on that patient's tooth and it goes right to the max and they don't feel it, I know that tooth is ready to make access and the patient's not gonna feel it. Because there's a lot of false readings, false negative readings, false positive readings that make this test sort of unreliable as something that we're gonna use routinely. But it does give an indication of pulp vitality, especially when you compare it to a control tooth. So if I have a patient and I do the ice test, for instance, and they don't feel the cold, then I'll go to the electric pulp test tip. I won't do that as a first course of action. So we've done the pulpal analysis. Now let's look at the periridicular area. Let's look at the periodontal ligament and the attachment apparatus status. Now there's percussion, right? And what is percussion information? What is the information that percussion gives us? Well, what it does, it indicates the inflammation of the periodontal ligament of the tooth that's causing the problem. Now percussion sensitivity can occur with teeth that, uh, you know, if the patient grinds their teeth and the ligaments inflame, certainly if you percuss a tooth and give it, you know, a painful response. So the first thing I do is I go around the arch, again, on a normal tooth with a gloved finger. And I apply only very mild, gentle finger pressure. And I don't use the back of a mirror handle initially. And if they feel everything's fine with a gloved finger, then I'll go very gently, very light tapping, starting with a normal tooth, uh, on the long axis of that, long axis of the root, and seeing if the patient feels it, compared to the control teeth, compared to a normal tooth. Now, I always do a periodontal exam. If I could, I would test 360 degrees around that tooth, because the gum tissue can provide a lot of information with respect to, you know, periapical problems, periodontal problems, endoperial problems as well. For instance, a long, thin pocket may represent a draining endodontic lesion. A long, thin pocket may also indicate a vertical root fracture. A lot of things that it can. A wide pocket usually is a periodontal origin. And if a patient has a sinus tract or a fistula, then it's important that we do what's called a sinugram, where we trace that. And we see exactly where that's tracing from in order that it will help us in the diagnosis because sometimes a fistula or and or sinus tract right, can be draining on the gingiva but originating from a distant tooth. So it's important that we do follow up on that. Very important. We have bite tests in order to see if the tooth has what we call cracked tooth syndrome. Cracked tooth syndrome, a syndrome is a collection of symptoms and Patients are having cracked teeth left, right, and center these days. And it's important that we make an accurate diagnosis. And cracked teeth probably represent the, represents the grayest area in endodontic diagnosis and, of course, long-term prognosis as well because we're never sure how far that crack's extended or how far it's going to extend during the lifetime of a tooth. So let's look at the radiographic exam. And once again, it'll identify pathosis, 
It'll aid in the determination of how many roots a particular tooth has, give you some indication of the curvature of the roots and their relationship to normal anatomical structures. For example, the sinus, the mental nerve, right? The malar buttress. And, you know, we can see from this radiograph that we want to take a good periradicular, periapical. We want to make sure we see the whole tooth from occlusal to apical. We want to see that periodontal ligament nice and uniform in a healthy tooth. And if it does balloon out, often we see that as pathosis. Take a look at the bone in, uh, in between the teeth, right? Look at the pulp chambers. There are calcifications there. Can we see that root canal space, you know, clearly? It'll all give an indication in the degree of difficulty of that particular root canal. And also, if we see a calcifying pulp, often it'll give us some indication of pulpal degeneration. So periapical radiographs, of course, are of utmost importance. And bite wings also are quite helpful to assess the tooth in the in the mesiodistal direction and the occlusal apical direction as well. And if you see on the x-ray on the left, you can see the root canal actually through that resorption. That's an external resorption. And of course, when we diagnose resorption, you want to take off angles with your periapical radiograph. In this case, with external resorption, if you come from an angle, that external resorption will often move in relation to the dental pulp or in relation to the root canal itself. Internal resorption as well. And it's important that we understand what we're dealing with and take the proper x-ray in order to assess and make a proper diagnosis. In addition to doing that, it's really nice for treatment planning as well, where we can you know, show our patients you know, what we're doing and why we're doing it and the relation of certain anatomical structures when it's on a big screen rather than holding up a little periapical uh, over the overhead light. Very good for patient management. And of course, you know, with the uh, digital radiography, you can enhance certain enhancement features. We don't actually have to increase the dose of radiation to increase the contrast. You just hit the enhancement button, revealer function in certain, in certain systems, and uh, provides us with great detail. Really, really nice uh, with minimal radiation. So, now we're looking at CBCTs, and I want to thank my colleague, Brett Gilbert. He's an excellent clinician in Chicago and my compadre. We lecture together. We write articles, to get, write articles together as well. And, uh, you know, we've always talked about comb beams, and just recently in the last couple of years, have we both actually got them in our office? And uh, what is 3D imaging? I mean, comb beam tomography, basically a scan goes around the patient's head to capture tiny little square-shaped images called voxels. And then what happens is the, Q, the computer assembles the millions of these tiny square voxels into a 3D image. It reconstitutes it. It's quite amazing. So you see different views of that actual tooth that you're looking at or actual teeth in an axial cross section, right? A frontal section and also a sagittal section. It's wonderful. And depending on the make and the brand that you have will depend on the resolution that you have. But the main difference between a medical CT and a dental CT is that the images in the medical are captured in rectangular shapes. So it makes it more difficult to reassemble these images in, um, in 3D. So let's look at comb beams and endodontics. What I love about it, number one, is the resolution is a lot higher. You know, patients come in with discomfort, they've had root canal treatment or they haven't had root canal treatment, and you take x-rays, and it can be sometimes for years, and you don't see any change on the radiograph. But you take a 3D image, because the resolution is so high, everything becomes so much clearer. I like to do it pre-surgically as well. If I'm working and doing surgery on a mandibular molar or anything distal to a second mandibular, second premolar, I want to make sure I know where the mandibular canal is, and I want to make sure I know where that mental foramen is so I can minimize any risk of causing any numbness to that patient. It's excellent for determining the type of resorption, the location of the resorption, and the actual extent of the, uh, of the resorption as well. Helps in locating canals. It's not uncommon where I take the rubber dam off, put the temporary filling in the patient's tooth, and march them to the comb beam when I'm looking for a canal, when I know that one may exist. And rather than um, 
risk perforation or structurally compromising the integrity of that tooth by troughing further with my burrs or my ultrasonics, I'll take a CBCT and it'll show me exactly where I'm going and how I can reorient myself in order to find that canal that I'm looking for. It helps to determine the bony pattern that's consistent with root fracture. It's very difficult unless the pieces of the root are completely separate to see a root fracture, even on a CBCT that has high resolution. And it's excellent for patients that can't take regular periapical radiographs, patients that gag, those strong gag reflexes. So CBCTs are quite helpful. So it's not uncommon where we may take three or four CBCTs during a day, of course not on the same patient, but in individual patients, in order to help in diagnosis, in order to help find those canals. Certainly when patients come in and they've had root canal treatment done and it's failed, we'll often take a CBCT to see the origin of the failure. Was it another canal, right? Was it an isthmus? Is there evidence of a root fracture? So it's a very powerful tool that's becoming more useful as the years go on and will continue as the resolution of the software becomes better. Because we can see all the way down that root canal. We can see in the coronal third, we can see in the middle third, and we can see in the apical one third. Fantastic. Comb beams, rock. So we've captured our subjective information from the patient interview. We've gone through our diagnostic tests, our pulpal tests, our periridicular tests, right? We've listened to the patient. Now we're going to make a diagnosis, but not just a single diagnosis. We have to make a dual diagnosis based on the pulpal status and based on the apical status as well. So let's look at the pulpal status. Tooth responds normal to cold, goes, the, it remisses right away, right? Normal pulp, right? If patient has decay and you remove that decay and they're having cold sensitivity and the cold sensitivity goes away, it's reversible pulpitis. Symptomatic irreversible pulpitis, it's that tooth when you put the cold on and that pain is unrelenting, it crescendos. The patient develops that ache and reproduces the pain that they've been experiencing. What is asymptomatic irreversible pulpitis? Well, if there's very deep decay in a tooth, they may not be feeling it, but there's a pulp exposure from that decay, we know there's a pulpitis in there. We just know that that's occurring through the science. So it's asymptomatic, but it's an irreversible pulpitis. Pulpal necrosis doesn't respond to cold, doesn't respond to electric pulp test. Tooth that's had root canal treatment obviously is known as previously treated. And if a root canal has had been initiated, then pulpectomy, et cetera, previously initiated root canal treatment. And then we make that apical diagnosis. It could be normal apical tissues where it's not sensitive to percussion or biting or apical palpation. Symptomatic, asymptomatic apical periodontitis. Asymptomatic, well, a tooth is non-vital, has a lesion of uh, endodontic origin. That's quite evident, but it may not be hurting the patient. How about a chronic apical abscess, one that's draining through a fistula or a sinus tract? What's the difference between a fistula and a sinus tract? We are asked that in our exam. Well, the fistula joins two body cavities, and a fistula is also lined by epithelium, and a sinus tract is lined by granulation tissue. And it's more often that you have a sinus tract rather than a true fistula. That won't be on the exam, just in case you're worried. And then there's condensing osteitis. When a tooth has a lot of insult and injury from a deep filling, sometimes even trauma, carries of long-standing origin is the body will respond by depositing increased thickness of bone at the periridicular area, known as condensing osteitis. And if there's no obvious reason for the pain, well, sometimes there's just no local dental cause for it. Sometimes the patient has virgin teeth, not a filling can be, no cracks, but they have pain, burning pain, a pulsatile pain, a constant pain, a pain that's lasted for months or years if it's a root canal problem, it usually doesn't last for months or years, right? It usually will localize and come to the surface where an accurate diagnosis can be made. Patient comes in with pain and you anesthetize their whole oral cavity and they still have the pain. Well, chances are it's not a tooth problem or a pulpal problem, certainly not an endodontic problem. 
and failure to respond to reasonable therapy. So we have to look at all these things and we have to make some sort of diagnosis because there's lots of things now. And as the population ages, we're getting patients that come in with fibromyalgia. We're getting patients that come in with myofascial pain. I've had two patients over the 30 years that have actually had heart attacks. They were having a heart attack because they were having jaw pain and pain into their, and pain into their, uh, their left arm. Psychogenic pain. Patients sometimes just want to come and talk, right? And of course, trigeminal neuralgia and atypical facial neuralgia is on the rise as our aging population increases as well. And of course, infections such as herpes zoster, shingles before the outbreak of the skin lesions. Quite often, patients will have severe pain and it can be quite debilitating. And it's important that we make a accurate diagnosis. And if we can't make a diagnosis, then we do not treat. Give the patient an anti-inflammatory. Give them a painkiller. Schedule them to come back in a week. Give them your business card and your cell number and say if there's any problem, if you need me before your next scheduled appointment, call any time. Because I'd rather have the patient disturb me at 11 o'clock at night than make the wrong diagnosis and not provide the proper treatment. So let's look at a couple case presentations. And I want to thank Dr. Brian Jaffeen from Toronto, who provided this case where a patient came into the office and uh, had a problem. 62 year old female patient referred for endo treatment of the mandibular right second premolar. But when you look at the mandibular second premolar, you don't see really a deep filling. You see a DO composite, right? distal DO composite, you see a lot of room between that composite and the pulp. But the only thing that the patient had done and their history re revealed is that they had a restoration and the pain started after that. And that was the only two, so let's zero in, right? That's all about listening to the patient. So tell me, when did the pain start? It started after the dentist did the filling. Which two? This two, is that the only two? That's the only two, doctor. And I've been living on Advil with no relief. So we go through our testing. Patient's medical history, important. The patient had asthma, non-contributory to this particular situation. Clinical exam, normal to percussion, normal to palpation, sensitive to cold and hot, and the pain lingered. And we took a look at the radiograph and it showed and corroborated that the patient had a recent restoration. So it was a symptomatic irreversible pulpitis. And what's the treatment? Root canal treatment in this particular case. Why did it occur? Well, perhaps that dentist leaned on that drill a little bit too hard. Perhaps smoke came out of the tooth. Perhaps the water wasn't used properly. There's a whole host of things that could have happened during the restorative treatment that allowed this to happen. And sometimes it just happens. Here's a case that came into the office. The dentist did not take a preoperative radiograph and a crown was placed. A nice well-fitting crown, but the patient presented to the office with pain on biting. A little bit of swelling on the lower right-hand side. We took a radiograph and certainly you can see a previously treated root canal with apical periodontitis. Medical history was non-contributory. And the mandibular right first molar, of course, was sensitive to percussion and biting. A little bit of swelling in the MB fold, but the second premolar and the second molar tested vitally symptomatic, meaning they responded normal to cold, normal to percussion, and normal to biting. Radiographic examination revealed that a previous root canal treatment had been done, but an apical lesion was present. Symptomatic apical periodontitis of a previously treated tooth. So what's the solution? Well, endodontic retreatment. Certainly there are others. You always have to tell the patient you have the option of removing that tooth and replacing it with a bridge, an implant, or a removal appliance of some kind. You're obligated to tell the patient the alternatives to treatment. You can guide them into the treatment that you recommend. In this case, we guided them into retreatment. But we also told the patient that it is possible that the lesion may persist and apical surgery may need to be done at a later time. And we brought the patient back for checkup at six months, at one year, and at two years, and you can see that that lesion has healed beautifully. 
root canal treatment really does work. To maintain that patient's tooth for a lifetime is a reward in itself. Here's a case that was treated in another city. Patient was in on business in Toronto and uh, patient was having incredible pain. A 46 year old patient was referred for pain of this lower left first molar. Recanal treatment was started in their hometown of Calgary, but get this, patient had the same symptoms as he did before the root canal was treated. Uh-oh, the same symptoms? I don't like that. And you can see in that lower first molar, there's some radio, uh, radio opaque calcium hydroxide that was placed into the tooth when the pulpectomy was done. So we went through our systematic diagnostic protocol and we see on this second molar that the patient has this distal crack. And adjacent to that distal crack was a 10 millimeter pocket. But what's interesting with this case is that the patient had cold sensitivity, which indicates to me that this crack probably was somewhat new. The patient had a history of eating unpopped popcorn kernels. Went to the movie theater, trailer was over, no popcorn left, started crunching on those little tiny popcorn kernels and crack, the tooth crack. It's important to test adjacent teeth as well. But the lower first molar had the pulpectomy with the radiograph, radiopaque calcium hydroxide. So what did we do? Well, I had to take out that second molar because that was the offending tooth. It had a symptomatic irreversible pulpitis and a vertical root fracture. 10 millimeter pocket. There's no hope for that particular tooth. So we finished the root canal on the first molar. And of course, the question that came out of the patient was, did that tooth really need root canal? And the answer was, probably eventually, may have, we don't know. Point is, make an accurate diagnosis, take your time. If you can't make the diagnosis, don't treat. Reappoint the patient. It doesn't hurt. Give them your cell number. Give them your email address. Tell them that you're available. So they have that as a little bit of a security, uh, security blanket. So they'll know. They'll build confidence in you because the last thing you want to do is treat the wrong tooth. And of course, proper documentation is key. So, so important. Write everything down. Make sure that you do. So if the patient comes back again, you know exactly what's going on and what happened. So in summary, hopefully we've satisfied the objectives of endodontic treatment, right, which is to prevent or eliminate apical periodontitis and satisfy the objective of dental treatment, which is to retain the patient's tooth, hopefully for a lifetime. And there's a whole host of factors that are involved with completing a successful root canal making a proper diagnosis, understanding pathosis is, is important, making sure you make a proper diagnosis and met out the proper treatment. And again, I can't emphasize enough, do not treat until you've made an accurate diagnosis. So at this point, what I'd like to do is uh, hand the things back to Rich and uh, have a little discussion, maybe a little Q&A, any questions that you may have. I don't think any of us realized that it would be a comedy show as well as an informative endodontics lecture this evening, Dr. Glassman. Really enjoyed your humor throughout. I'm sure everybody here did too. There's some uh, some really nice comments, but let's start with this particular one from Lindsay who asks, why are electric pulp testers debated as a diagnostic method? How come they're in that conversation today? Well, it just doesn't really provide such an accurate accurate information it's it's either black or white they either feel it or they don't there's no in between and that's the thing plus you can get a lot of false positives with electric pulp testers because a lot of times you get conduction into the periodontal ligament as well so what you may feel that may be pulpal may actually be periapical to periridicular as well gotcha a little uh little off the, the reservation um, I know that this topic is something you're going to explore a little bit further in the next part of the series, but would you touch on one of our guests is asking us about removal of the biofilm in the smear layer and specifically what is your, in, in your repertoire for that, for that process? And I know that it's a longer answer than you can probably give here in this, in this session. 
Well, to remove the bile, to remove the smear layer, number one, you got to remove the organic component, which is organic tissue, obviously, and you want to remove the inorganic. So to remove the organic tissue, we use sodium hypochlorite. And there's many studies that are looking at different dilutions of it. But if you look at the studies by Dunavan and others, and we'll go through that in, uh, in one or two seminars from now, that um, full-strength sodium hypochlorite is the best, dissolves tissue the best. If you warm it up, it actually increases the chemical reactivity of it by up to four times. And with respect to the inorganic component of the smear layer, we use a 70% aqueous solution of EDTA. Very effective for removing that. I feel a little guilty. I, I've seen uh, read ahead in the script a little bit, and I know that we're going to talk about the chemistry specifically in, in, the, in the coming weeks in this series, uh, which I think also addresses Rushdie's question. He asks, uh, can you explain methods to place calcium hydroxide to the apex when you don't have instruments and in some of the latest innovations uh, like lentulo spirals and others that I know are part of your repertoire, Dr. Glassman? Well, yeah, it's a tricky situation because you want to make sure that you keep that calcium hydroxide within the confines of the root canal itself. And you're not going to get a three-dimensional seal with fill of calcium hydroxide. If you're lucky, you're going to get it in the coronal third and possibly as close to the apex as you can without extruding it past the apex because it's very alkaline. It can be quite caustic inflammatory potential as well. So what I do into appointment, should I do a two-appointment endo, I'll make sure I dry my canals, I'll fill up the pulp chamber with aqueous calcium hydroxide, one of the proprietary brands. Uh, you can also do it inexpensively by going to the pharmacy and getting calcium hydroxide USP, medical grade powder, mixing it with sterile water. And what I do is I place it into the pulp chamber, fill up the pulp chamber brimful with it, and I'll use a lentula spiral very slowly, very gently, only in the coronal third, and that will help drive it apically, but again, be very safe with it. That's great. A uh, question from one of our students, Daniel, who asks, is hot testing necessary in endo? In their school environment, they concentrate on cold testing. I agree, cold testing probably is gonna be used way more than hot testing, um, but some patients come in and their chief complaint is, it only hurts when I drink something hot, right? So that'll reproduce the patient's symptoms. So that's when I'll bring up my hot pulp test tip in those situations. Also, there's something that I call a reverse cold test and uh, sort of getting off topic a little bit. You know, patients come in sipping a can of soda or sipping a cold bottle of water because and when you have a degenerating pulp, often the interpulpal pressure builds up and just the body heat will often cause the patient to have severe pain. So what I'll often do is I'll tell the patient, stop sipping the water, let the pain build, and I'll go around to a tooth with an ice stick, every tooth with an ice stick, and they may feel it, they may not. And then when you get to the suspected tooth, all of a sudden that pain decreases. Kind of cool test, it's called the reverse ice test. That's new for me as well. Uh, Dahlia said, great lecture, Dr. Glassman. What about pulpal and apical diagnosis of immature teeth with recent or previous history of trauma? That's an excellent question because they're very difficult. Even incompletely formed apices that haven't had trauma are often unreliable for pulp testing. But if we look at cases such as the ones that you just described with open apices that have undergone trauma, quite often, is very difficult to get a pulpal response. And if you don't, it doesn't mean you should do endo, it means you should wait and retest those teeth perhaps in another month. Fantastic. Uh, when you're in a two appointment root canal approach, how long do you normally look to schedule your, your patients, Dr. Glassman, between those two intervals? One week. One week, all right. Is there any clinical indication or or, or condition where you're not considering endodontic therapy. Um, can you expand on that a little bit? Uh, I get the sense of if there is an instance where you're always looking through that lens, I'm sure, as a, as a, as a specialist in the field, is there any particular patient that shouldn't be part of your, when you see that initial assessment, would be kind of the way I'm interpreting the question. 
Well, um, let me, yeah, okay, well, there's some patients that uh, just don't take care of their teeth, <laughs> and the uh, patient needs root canal treatment, and I know that they're going to run into the same situation that they had before because they don't floss and they don't brush, then I'll suggest perhaps they should have those teeth removed. And, um, you know, it's not uncommon throughout the day where I often do. Patients who have cracked teeth, very, very, as I mentioned earlier, very gray area. And uh, depending on their symptoms, it can range from anywhere from a very mild bite sensitivity, where all that may be needed is a full coverage and a crown and no root canal, to the case, like the case I just showed you with a vertical root fracture, where we recommend that the tooth be removed. Always give the patient the alternatives and always give the patient best assessment of predictability wherever you possibly can. Fantastic. There's another question that I want to address just uh, as your moderator for the evening. We'll let Dr. Glassman grab a quick sip. Uh, we'll have a question about the differences between reciprocating and rotary instruments, pros and cons. And I believe that's a specific element that we're going to be covering next uh, in our very next part of our series when we're talking about the preparation of the root canal space. Is that where we have that slot in the series, Correct. Dr. Glassman? Correct. I'll be expanding with really nice uh, visual animations that will show you the uh, difference between rotary and reciprocation, the advantages of rotary, the advantages of reciprocation, and the disadvantages of both. And we're also going to expand on one more thing called adaptive motion, where there is a feedback loop between the file and the motor where the motion of the file will adjust to the intracanal torsional stresses. That's called adaptive motion. It's sort of a hybrid in between rotary and reciprocation, and we will go into detail on that. All right, folks, if uh, you have any last question, this is your opportunity for it, but otherwise we're going to let Dr. Glassman uh, finish his very long day today and uh, show a little bit, uh, actually, if you would, Dr. Glassman, would you show us the, the agenda for our October 5th session so they have an understanding of what we're trying to cover there? We certainly do. We are going Perfect. to talk about accessing because uh, we want to access for success. As I mentioned uh, at the very beginning of the seminar, it's important that we find all those orifices. So we're going to take you through some troubleshooting tips on how to find those canals, uh, instrument selection. Uh, we're going to... Uh, begin the process of shaping the root canal. We're going to talk about glide path, that pathway in which we need to have before we actually take our nickel titanium instrument. We need to own that canal from orifice to apex, and during this seminar, we'll teach you how. All right. The link is right on screen for you, everyone. Thanks for spending time with us this evening and your attention. Uh, a big thank you to our sponsors at Kerr Endodontics for making this happen. And uh, we're going to close tonight, if you wouldn't mind, folks, with a very quick survey, if you wouldn't mind providing your feedback. I've had a lot of great comments that I want to mention to Dr. Glassman, and we'll certainly pass all along all of your kudos to him. Thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you for parts two, three, and four of this informative session on endodontic therapy. Thanks, everyone, and have a great night. See you next month.